For God so loved the world that he killed every single person on the planet except eight people. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's got to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Hey, preacher, come over here to this crevice. I would like to show you who's occupying the crevices and the charred walls of hell. As I look over the side of the burning pit and the molten lava is burping up, reminding us of the judgment of God, with a smirk on his face, the bell boy of hell turns around and says, Look, preacher, this is the crevice of the reprobates. This is where all your rock and roll singers, your child molesters, your whoremongers, your God deniers, your atheists, this is where all your cults and your sodomites and your fags and your lesbians and your sex perverts, this is where they all come when they die and they perish without God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're living in days where people don't like to preach on reprobates going to hell. But Romans chapter number 1 is just as real tonight as it was the day the Apostle Paul penned it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Convert your children Happens bit by bit Quietly and subtly And you will barely notice it We're coming for them We're coming for your children The gay agenda is coming home The gay agenda is here We'll convert your children will turn to you. Every reprobate that dies without God will die with a seared conscience, a warped mind, and they'll open their eyes in a Christless hell. We are living in a society in a world that is reprobate without God. I was in Chicago years ago, and I was canvassing as a car porter selling Bible rings to Home Circle. And we come to one great big mansion where uh, the folks were rich in that area and cars all around it and so forth. But I went up the door and I was pretty sure this fellow's Catholic, so I gave him a Catholic canvas. And he invited me in. And then uh, as soon as he got in, he turned the key in, in the door. And I said, wait a minute, what am I getting into? He opened another door into a great big mammoth parlor and a great big mammoth dining room with double doors in between and all seated around the whole business was uh, uh, prelates from some from Europe and all the big ones from America they were planning the Eucharistic Congress in Chicago as way back in the 1920s and uh, when uh, they started talking to me they tried to get me to be one of them and offered me every kind of a conceivable opportunity that you could think of. They offered me everything, money, scholarship, and the whole works, and told me the advantage of being Catholic and what they were planning on doing in America and with America. They said, we're going to take over America, and, they, and we've already got it fixed, so know how 
in the world can they escape becoming under our authority and well we'll be in the jurisdiction and take over I said well how are you going to take over the south it's it's uh, predominantly Protestant it says we're going to seed the south with Catholic families and then when they marry into the Protestants their children will be raised Catholic and before long we'll have uh, a quarter and then we'll have a third then we'll have over half and when we get over half we, we've got America that's one way of doing it but it says that we've got other ways too well I says supposing all this was known and the people in Protestant knew this uh, he said if they knew what we were planning on doing there'd be bloodshed in 24 hours and lots of them in 48 I says are you prepared to take over in case that that happens he said yes we have our standing armies we have everything all prepared with guns, ammunition, and the whole works. And uh, said, uh, we can take over, and you might as well join us and be in the, with us and, and get in on the uh, right side of the fence. I said to him, I said, listen, there is nothing you can do to invigor me to become a Catholic. I mean nothing. I says, I know my horse is going through to eternity. And I'm riding on it. And I know your horses aren't, and I know that you'll be non-plus entities when I'll be enjoying eternity and having a good time forever. And I'm going to see to it that I'm on the right side of the fence. And I know which side I'm on now. And uh, I said, you might as well open the door and let me out because I know that other people know that I'm in here and there'll be an investigation made if, if you don't let me out. One of the big fellows with a red cardinal hat got up and said sir he says we're going to let you out but we want you to know one thing that everybody that's born in the United States that's not born a Catholic is on a card you're put on a white card to begin with and kept on a white card until we feel like that we need to watch you after that we put you on a blue card and said after you're on a blue card for a while if we feel like it we just assume you wasn't existing you're on a red card so from now on you'll be on the red card as long as you live when i was in detective work in washington dc during world war ii i was going home to alexander virginia from washington dc and when i got to the mall there was two scholars and they were sticking up their fingers for a ride. I says, I'll just pick them up and put them in the back seat and see what I can find out from them. And so when they got in the back seat and was seated, I asked them, I said, you boys are from Georgetown University taking the priesthood, aren't you? No, we're not taking the priesthood, they said. Well, I said, your scholars from Georgetown University are taking something. What are you taking? <coughs> they said, we're Anglican brothers. Oh, I said, I've never, the church has never told us what Anglican brothers are, nor uh, much about them, and I don't know much about them. What uh, do Anglican brothers do, and what are they for? They said, well, we're taking uh, studies to uh, work with the Protestant churches and get them to come in to the, do what the church wants them to do and to work with them and work with us and uh, I said well how many of you folks are taking the course we said well, about 780 and uh, I said how many graduates all oh, some heard between 780 and 700 and 800 uh, no 700 and, uh, and 780. I said, uh, now, uh, uh, how many graduated last year? And they told me. And then I said, the year before that. And they told me. And I went back till we had about 3,800 people graduated out in the field. And I said, well, what do you boys do when you go out in the field? No, I said, At first I want to know uh, uh, how, how many graduate next year. Well, it said it'll be somewhere under 900 anyway. And I said, how? How about, uh, what do you do when you 
uh, graduate, said, well, the first thing, we change our names. And when we change our names, then we're allocated so many to this church, so many to that church, and to another church. And I said, when you go out to the churches, then what do you do? He said, well, the first thing we do is look around for some nice young ladies we'd like to make a, an associate member with, and then uh, we marry them. And after we're married, we go off to a, a Protestant a theological seminary or school, and we come out a Protestant minister. Then we're taught to, in our course, to work up to the heads as fast as we can in that line, and um, where we're supposed to work in. And uh, I said, now, uh, do all of you work in the same field? No, says some of us work, but we all work in the church, trying to get the churches to unite with us and do what they want. Us, we want them to do. So were these Roman Catholic uh, students then? They were. As far as I learned, from what I learned, they were Jesuits. I know they don't want to infiltrate the Protestant churches, but they infiltrate their schools. And I know one fellow that got to be teacher in the Methodist school, and as a result of that, a lot of the Methodist uh, ministers today are carrying communist cards. They utilize anything and everybody to bring their uh, means to an end. The subject of Jesuit infiltration into Protestant churches, whenever that subject is brought up, it's often ignored, dismissed, or just uh, brushed aside. For some reason, they don't like to think of this fact. But the story I'm about to tell you occurred in 1939 at a Seventh-day Adventist institution. Washington Missionary College, located in Tacoma Park, Maryland. This was told to me by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson, who was president of the college from 1935 to 1945. Now, Dr. Wilkinson told me that he uncovered a Jesuit infiltrator at that time, in 1939. And this is how it happened. There had been a new Bible instructor hired by the board, and this man had been teaching Bible to the undergraduate theological majors for about five months. Now Dr. Wilkinson had always encouraged an open-door policy, and he encouraged the confidences of his students, especially his theological students. Now some of these young men came to him after a period of about four or five months, and they said, Dr. Wilkinson, there's, you know, you, you teach Bible differently than this new Bible instructor does. There's some things about him that we don't understand. He brings up doubts in the classroom. Doubts about our theological position, about our doctrines. These doubts are then not resolved. They're left sort of hanging in the air. And they had other questions, which Dr. Wilkinson couldn't, couldn't answer. It aroused Dr. Wilkinson's suspicions about this man. Now, the teachers had in, in uh, Old Columbia Hall uh, little pigeonholes, boxes where their mail uh, slots, you know, they used to uh, put their uh, mail in these little pigeonholes and the faculty would come and pick up their, their letters. Uh, this one day, uh, Wilkinson saw an envelope being placed by the mailman in the mail slot for this uh, Bible teacher. And the letter was a rather long, rectangular, official looking letter. And after the mailman left, Dr. Wilkinson stepped over to the box and he drew the letter out. And he looked at it and the return address was a Hereford Road address. Now, Wilkinson knew that that was a Jesuit college. It wasn't located too far from Washington Missionary College. He took the letter and he steamed it open. Of course, this was an illegal act. But, you know, when you're dealing with a class like they are, they committed many illegal acts in their time, the assassination of princes being the least of their illegal acts. 
And you know, the Jesuit motto is the end justifies the means. Wilkinson thought, I'm going to steam this letter open. And if, if it's an innocent thing, I'll just close it up again, say nothing. Steam it open and inside he found orders from this young man's superior, telling the young man, outlining to him what he was to preach or, or teach uh, in his Bible class for the next several months. Dr. Wilkinson reinserted the letter, gummed the flap back on. He called the young teacher in. He said to this young man, he had the letter on his desk, you know, and he said to this young man, I have a piece of mail for you. And he handed it to him. And he said, he says, we know who you are, and we know why you are here. You are a Jesuit, are you not? The young man looked across the desk at Dr. Wilkinson. He picked up his mail, turned on his heel, and walked out. And it was the last they ever saw of this man. He never even stopped to pick up his pay. But he cleared off of that campus the very same hour.